from the nation's capital, this is the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast with your host, Rob Snow White. for downloading the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. My name is Rob Snow White. This is Series 1, Episode 90, The Challenges of Catching Snakehead on the Fly. I gave the talk last night at the Potomac Patuxent Chapter of Trout Unlimited in Silver Spring, Maryland. I gave myself three hours to get there. It's about 19 miles away. It only took about an hour and 45 minutes, which gave me time to hang out and catch up on some emails out front of the building. I was invited by Alan Burroughs, the co-chair of Mid-Atlantic Trout in the Classroom. The room where I gave the talk was extremely cold, so I kind of mumble at the beginning as I start to warm my body up. Like I said, it was cold in there. Sit back, relax. The audio might be a bit dodgy as I'm walking back and forth across a large room with a microphone set up. This is all taken from previous podcasts, but this is what it sounds like. When I give a talk on fly fishing for snakeheads. Super. All right. So this talk is going to be challenges of catching snakeheads on the fly. That should have been in parentheses. So hopefully this is updated. Uh, you can go out and bass fish for them. You know, like uh, not fly fishing. So spinning rods, bait casters using Senko worms and frog patterns, horny toads, chatterbaits, and you can get them all day long in some spots. And my friend just moved to Seattle. He considered them bycatch. He, he got pissed that he caught them. The bass tournament guys don't like them. They say they mess up their rigs. But if you ask me, I think this is probably one of the coolest fish you can catch in the Potomac if you can catch it. And I'm going to go over the difficulties tonight. And while we're limited as fly anglers for catching them, has anyone here ever tried to catch one or targeted them before? One, two, anyone caught one? Mark? All right, so I've only caught five. And since they've been in the river in 2004. Let's go to the next slide. So a little bit about me. I've got a BS in biology, graduated in 99. I worked at Orvis. Uh, on and off for the last 16, 17 years throughout Northern Virginia, West Virginia, Colorado, and Key Largo. Uh, I was a biology teacher, so I feel like I'm teaching bio again up here doing a PowerPoint, except you're not all gangbanger thugs that want to be somewhere else. You're here by choice. And I quit corporate life wearing a suit and tie in 2010 to wear flip-flops most of the year. I can't imagine trying to wear a suit on these summer days ever again. All right, next slide. So what I'm going to cover tonight are the challenges in catching them because we're not conventionally fishing for them. We're using fly rods. Go over the description so you don't get them confused with other species, how to identify them, how they grow, where they live, what they eat, where to find them, what you need to catch them, and then some of the flies I throw and how to throw them. This is... Uh, Roaches Run Waterfowl Sanctuary. We were fishing Brian Chow, if you're familiar with him. He's a contract hire for MFC, works with Thomas and Thomas. He tells me all this afterwards. Uh, but we were using a two-handed rod, and we were, it's like, you know, we're going where there are some snakeheads, but we're probably not going to catch one. And he catches a 10-inch crappie, and then about a minute later, he catches this one. So I've only had two clients to ever catch one on the fly rod, and he's one of them. And uh, also go over just why they're total freaks of nature. Because they're not like anything else you're going to find around here. Next slide. All right, so the challenges of fly fishing. And this is with just an iPhone. So I'll go over where you can observe them up close. Your tackle, we're limited to our fly rods. We have tippets that will break at a certain point. We can't throw 100 feet back into the weeds where these things live. So we are physically challenged by our gear to try and get where these fish live. They're going to be located in spots we can't get to with a boat, without a boat, maybe if you've got a kayak. But once you're back there, you still have to be stealthy. It's not like you can be on the bow of the boat with a spinning rod and throw it, your lure 100 feet 
pull that through the weeds with braided line. I'm using maybe 14 pound tippet. And that's about as thick as I want to go. I don't want to break my rod over a fish. We're also limited because the bow hunters are cleaning them out faster than they're really reproducing. These guys are going out every night, some guys six, seven nights a week, and they're getting 30 to 40 fish. You do that in all the creeks, you are going to do some damage on the population. And they're selling them for dollars on the pounds. These guys are making money. So they're going out every night. I've been told that some of the residents along the river are getting upset because the bright lights and the loud noise from the bow hunters. I don't know if they're cracking down on them, but they are definitely taking out some big ones. The weeds are a huge problem this time of year. You just can't get to a lot of spots. You gotta wait for those. I guess we're losing two and a half minutes of daylight a day right now, so it's getting darker, less sunlight. The weeds will start dying off. So early spring, late summer, early fall are your best chances to be able to get to them. It helps to have a boat. Not everyone has a boat. You can go to Marshall's and get a cheap kayak or Costco for 150 bucks, and that'll put you out where they are. Most of all, it's been at the right place at the right time. Everyone we've caught has pretty much been an accident, except for three of mine, so three out of five. And this was just taken at Huntley Meadow State Park. I'll show you a map directions earlier or later on. And uh, I just put my iPhone right on that. And just watch that fish for a good 10 minutes. Right, next slide, please. So what do these fish look like? Well, they have a fusiform sh uh, shaped body. The next slide will show the shape of that. They have a very small head. So the head's here. This was a 36 inch fish. So the head was maybe six inches and then 30 inches of body. Their head is very small and it's flattened. It's sort of kind of shovel shaped to it. And the eyes are kind of up and on the side of the head. So they can see kind of everything around you. There's only fish that'll make eye contact with you. They'll come up to breathe, they'll look at you in the eye, and they'll go back down. They have a large mouth. I've got a picture later with one that's opened up. They have no adipose fins. So that's how you can separate them from the other fish that are shaped like them. That elongated dorsal fin, we saw that in Brian's picture, and the round caudal fin, or the tail. Snake-like scales, and once you take them out of water, they're going to be very slimy. These fish can stay out of water for a week at a time, as long as they have that mucus coating on them. And they used to ship these from China in cardboard boxes, not in the water. Just put a hundred of them in a cardboard box, they'd ship them up to Seattle. And they'd survive in the boat for a week, where I don't know how long it takes to ship them. And that's the problem now, is people are taking them and dumping in all the reservoirs and local bodies of water, because they can live in a trash bag for a couple hours, unless they suffocate. So we've got them in Northern Virginia, in Burke Lake, Lake Braddock, they're in the Occoquan Reservoir, they're just popping up. Wherever people dump them, you put them in a smaller body of water, they're easier to catch. You can make more money selling them. And they've got these pits all around them. I don't know if those are sensory or if that's where the mucus comes out of, but once you pull them out of the water, it looks like you got hit by what? By Slimer and Ghostbusters. It's pretty gross. Next picture. So that's a Washington Post description of what they look like. You can see the round tail. And this is the long belly fin, that long dorsal fin, which isn't always up. And their peck fins are, are really soft. It's kind of like romaine lettuce. People always think that these things will walk up on land and use their peck fins to crawl around. Those things are just for, you know, turning in a circle in the underwater. And they're not firm enough to locomote. If you throw one of these on land, they will move their body in like a snake-like, undulator. Uh, locomotive way and they can get back in the water. You throw one 20 feet up on shore, it's going to get back in the water unless you kill it. And that's just what it looks like when you're going out electroshocking for them and that's their habitat. Luckily they don't get that big yet. They might. All right, Next picture please. So the mouth, this is one of the key things in, uh, in targeting them is they've got a, a pretty nasty mouth. It's made for latching onto food, shredding it, and not letting go. If you just look up feeding snakehead on YouTube, you'll see just blank aquariums, maybe some sand in the bottom. They'll throw a perch in there and they'll rip them in half and swallow them. Variety of teeth, the top's got fangs. If you peel back the gum, there's a line of vermiform teeth in there like a bass. And then there's spikes on the bottom and then on the roof of their mouth, they also have 
teeth. So whatever gets in there is not coming out. These fish do not open their mouth to give you your fly back. You have to use pliers or a stick or something else. I don't get my hand anywhere near them. If it's hard for me to open them up with a pair of saltwater pliers, that thing clamps on my hand. I do not want to be a part of that. It's a pretty nasty mouth. And they don't, I mean, just opening them for a picture, it's, it's not easy. Next slide. So here's some more pictures of their mouth. And this is a quote from Virginia Tech. No evidence suggests that they are any more voracious than the bass that already exist in greater numbers in the river. If anything could eat all the fish in the river, bass would have already done so. The bass have been in the Potomac since the 1850s, and they have not decimated the population. Our biggest threat now is the blue catfish, not the snakehead. That's just another picture of just how ferocious that mouth is. All right, next picture, some more mouth pictures. So you can see John Odenkirk, the Virginia biologist, opening one up with his fingers. He has a little more experience than I am, so I'll let him do that. And you can see each one of these, we're using something to open up their mouth. This one oddly had a lesion on its head. As soon as we pulled it out, a yellow jacket came out of nowhere and started chewing on the lesion. It's bizarre. And this one's got some huge fangs on it. I cut the head off of my first one and brought it home to dry it out and take a look at the skull. Uh, it was pretty nasty. That mouth was just nothing but teeth. Once all that flesh and stuff got eaten away by the beetles. Pretty gnarly. All right, next picture. So if you want to tell the difference between bowfin, burbot, snakehead, and there's the breakdown right there. You'll see these posted all around Northern Virginia, I guess Maryland probably too, the difference between a bowfin and a snakehead. I've never seen a bowfin in the wild. I've only seen them pickled and lab during college. So there's definitely a distinct part to them. And these guys have what's called a gular plate. It's a hard, bony chin. So if you ever have to worry about if you have a bowfin or snakehead, you can look under the chin. It's a hard, bony plate. Right, next picture. There's a guy with a bunch of burbots. I don't know what he's doing, but... <laughs> I, just, I don't know. I think it's Canadian. All right, next picture, what do we have? So growth. These things grow big here. They grow bigger and faster here than they do in their native Asia. All the way from uh, Kazakhstan, North Korea, Russia, China. They grow faster here than they do back home. And then there was that recent 18-pounder shot with a bow. Uh, this guy just brought his home and ate it. That was a world record. That was May of 2011 when he caught that. And that was down in the Occoquan. And this guy, Caleb something, that thing was probably 18 pounds also. He's obviously holding it out to make it look bigger. And you can see the mucus just dripping. For a while, I would just run up and scoop these things out of the water with my net. And we'd hold them up. and they would just, I mean, it, it's immediate. You pull them out, they start dripping with mucus. Then the park ranger said I'd get fined if he saw me dip netting them out in D.C. So I stopped doing it. Next picture, we got growth. So they grow fast here, four to five pounds in the first 1.5 growing season. So that's a fish this big is one years old. Thus, you can eat these fish. They grow faster than the heavy metals and toxins can be absorbed into their fatty tissues. So if you find one that's 10 pounds, go ahead and eat it. It's going to be the cleanest meat you're going to find in the river. So up to 100 millimeters a year in the Potomac, in their native range, they sexually reproduce at two to three years of age. Here, they do it at age one. So a five-pound fish is sexually mature at one year. After four years, they're going to slow down. And then the older the female, the more eggs she can hold. I've heard they can hold up to 100,000 eggs. So uh, five times a year, that's 500,000 eggs, and they guard their babies. So a good proportion of those are going to survive. Their fry get eaten by bass. Whereas these don't eat bass fry. I think they found maybe one bass in the stomach during a sampling. All right, next picture, what do we have? Habitat. So if you want to fish for them, you got to know where they are. And it depends on the time of year. So non-native with potential to be invasive, they're going to live exactly where largemouth bass lives. If I take you out bass fishing, it's the same as where you're going to be snakehead fishing. 
Um, we're always targeting snakeheads, but we consider the largemouth bass and catfish and everything else as bycatch. Uh, the biologists didn't think that they could survive closer to the Chesapeake Bay, and when we have droughts like we do now, more saline water comes up in the tidal section. They're doing fine. What they do is when there's a heavy rain, a big flood in the summer, they'll ride that freshwater plume down into the bay, and as that water goes you know, down the Potomac and then into the bay and then out, they'll find the feeder creeks and they can go up them. So they're in the Rappahannock, they're in the Susquehanna now, they're in the Patuxent River. We don't know if that's from them moving there or people dumping them. And as we know, it only took four fish to populate the entire Potomac from Little Falls down. So not a whole lot of genetic diversity in them, but it only took four fish. Benthopelagic, they want to sit on the bottom. These are lazy fish. They're just going to sit there and, and wait to ambush prey. They're not going to move a whole lot unless they're spawning. They're going to be in some nasty spots. They don't need... To breathe with their gills. So if they're halfway exposed during low tide, they can breathe, which they prefer to do using their mouth. They will come up and breathe in front of you, look at you, and then go back down. So you've got to find where these fish are. And oftentimes it's not somewhere where you can get to on foot. I'm going to cover those spots at the end. One spot I do see most of them is between spatter dock and a harder shoreline. And that water tends to be crystal clear. You can be out there in a boat or a kayak. That's usually where you see them. And when they're moving away from you, they will part the spatter dock. Spatter dock are the large, fibrous lily members that we have on the river. And that stuff's going to start dying off soon, so it gives you more access to where you can fish for them. And they just burrow in the mud, and they rely on air in their stored bladder. It's shut down their metabolism. Maybe they make it mucus coating. I don't know. It's still not known. We're still figuring all of this out. They've only been in the river for 12 years. We have not dialed in how to fish for them, but this is what we know so far. Next one. So feedy. Like I said, they're lazy fish. They're just going to sit there and ambush. They're going to wait for something to come by, and they're going to lunge out and eat it. Their number one fish they eat is the banded killifish. So if you've got a clouser four inches long, you're good to go. Apex predator, the only thing that's going to eat them in the river is going to be blue catfish once they get to a certain size. They just, they don't have fear. You can, just, like I said, scoop them up with a net. They're thrust feeders, so they'll sit and then just launch out, grab their prey, settle back, eat it. And they will feed in groups. They will hunt in packs, and they will communicate with each other on how to track down prey. So that sort of goes against being an ambush predator where you're just going to sit and wait. But apparently they'll go out, and they do eat up to 21 species of fish found in the Potomac River. I'll go through some of those coming up. The next slide. So what they eat. These are the stomach contents of one. There's a freshwater eel, and you've got a killifish. So as small snakeheads, they're going to eat invertebrates, scuds, dragonflies, damselfly nymphs, crayfish. But they're mostly going to eat killifish, shad, eels, perch, and bluegill. They have been gutted and found frogs, ducks, rats, we had one that had styrofoam, the one that Brian caught. We opened up its mouth. It had styrofoam kind of like back here in its jaw. My, uh, my friend Chad Wells cut one open, and it had battery inside of it, a double-A battery inside its stomach. Don't know how that got there, but these things apparently will eat whatever comes their way. So next, what do we have? So spawning. This is the key if you want to get them in the springtime. When you're fishing for shad around Fletcher's and you look down, you see females swimming up river. And they're going to be right along the shoreline because the, they're lazy fish. They don't want to burn calories going upstream. So they follow the shoreline, which is a soft water. They're moving upstream to redistribute their population. They don't want to lay eggs where the rest of them already live. They want to reduce competition for sexual mating they want to re get rid of competition for eating and just for habitat so go drop your eggs somewhere else and then you go back to another spot you've populated a new spot in the river which is also why they're in all the tidal creeks and other rivers i have never seen one of their nests uh, one of the guys in tidal potomac fly rotters found one 
in the Sino Canal, and he threw a fly in there, and he got the female. She hit his clouds as soon as it landed on the water. So they're going to make a hula hoop sized just kind of hole in the vegetation, and they might have tunnels going into it, which will keep other things from going in there, and then they'll circle the babies up to breathe, and then they'll bring them back down. If you throw a nest, if you throw a fly in the nest, you should be good to go. I just have never countered it. I'm always looking for them. But it's that hole, that vertical column of water. I've heard that they, they tend to trigger off of high water events and they tend to move up into these creeks and that triggers the spawn. Is there, do you know if there's any backing of that? We usually see it around the waters in the mid 60 degrees, mm -hmm. but it would make sense. There's more space to spawn up there and softer water to go up. All right, what do we have next? Should be a picture. That's, I don't even know if that's northern snakehead. I think I just once Googled snakehead fry. And that's what it looks like when they come up to breathe. They had a whole bit of that on monster fish. Yeah. All right, next one. So when? That's Ching Bridge. I'm shad fishing. I look down, and you know, 30-something inch snakehead. They're going to be at different locations by season. Springtime, they're moving up. The grasses and weeds haven't grown yet. They're going to be around the tidal basin intake. And... Um, just moving around the river. And then once summer comes, they're gonna hunker down and hang out and eat. And they're gonna move based on the tides. And again, if you don't have a boat, you're not gonna to get to a lot of these spots. But I've caught three or four of them on foot. All right, next one. So spring, again, that's a big snakehead right where we're shad fishing. Spring run, already mentioned this, they're looking to move. We've gutted. A lot of them, you get the cast netters, say you got it for me before you leave, and if they're willing to, they're always empty. I don't know if they digest things really fast. We just saw a picture of one with an eel and a fish in its stomach, so obviously it didn't digest those fast enough. But it looks like they're not eating, so they're probably biting out of aggression. The one I got during the shad run was sitting in clear water coming out of a creek that dumped into the river, and there are three of them, about that big, and I just dropped my clouser right next to its head, and it just turned its head and snapped at it. It got hooked on the outside of its mouth. I was with a guy from Montana. He was about to lose his bowels. He couldn't believe what was going on. He caught seven species of fish in maybe half an hour. And he's like, this just doesn't happen back west. And I was like, you don't know what you mean. He's like, what are we fishing for? And I'm like, 20 species can bite your, your line here. He got... Like a largemouth, striped bass, white perch, hickory shad, maybe gizzard shad, a couple other fish, needlefish maybe. And these are all mixed in. And you can see that water is perfectly calm. If you go out 30, 40 more feet, that water is raging. And if they get stuck in a tide pool and the tide drops, they will launch out of the water vertically and then land back in the river. Sometimes they just jump for no reason. The biologists from Maryland really want us to get it on film. And I'm like, yeah, that's not going to happen. I'd have to have GoPros in every direction on my boat when I'm walking around. But you'll just see them. They'll just jump straight up. They jump like salmon when they're going over the rocks at the Occoquan. They'll jump three, four feet in the air to go up in elevation. Next slide. So snaggers. There's some weird stuff you see at Chain Bridge. Here's a homemade spear. It's like a broom handle duct tape and that's a, a grill like a Weber grill and the guy cut around it so he had all these prongs and then this guy is, this is actually on video where he's uh, stabbing one in that tide pool you can see the snake is right there and he threw it at it and missed and everyone laughed this is what we saw five years ago you know, four years ago now these guys are using weighted treble hooks and rope on saltwater spinning rods. So the snakeheads will come up to breathe and they lower the treble hook down and gut them. And I've seen guys almost get pulled in the river. And I, you know, I'm trying to make an honest living when we see a snakehead, we're gonna cast to it. And these guys just come out of nowhere with spears and homemade gigs and cast nets. And they're in my way, so I call the cops. And it's illegal, you can't, you have to use rod and reel only down there. You can go above chain bridge right here on the Virginia side and snag them, but anywhere from 
back down to the entire DC shoreline, no snagging snakeheads. They do leave a lot of good headlamps behind if you get there in the morning, because they're out all night long. And you'll see a guy spend 10 hours and get one fish, and then they walk off with them in frame packs alive. So we don't know where they're putting them. If they're going to restaurants to sell them, if they're taking them home to eat them, or if they're dumping them in other bodies of water. All right, next slide. Summertime. That's probably the key time to get them. They're going to settle back down in slow water in all those weed mats. They're going to hang out. There's one that hangs out that's been tagged under a specific dock on Little Hunting Creek. I think there's an estimate of 60 per acre on Little Hunting Creek down by Mount Vernon. And this one was on the Occoquan. We were fishing for gar, and that thing came up and snagged a gar fly. And it's in my neighbor's freezer right now. My entire neighborhood, everyone's always asking for them. I'm like, well, in three years I'll get you the next one probably. That's about the average we get one. It's honestly, it's pure luck. This guy's like, I got a snakehead. And I'm like, all yeah, right, okay. And I go up to the front. I'm like, you got a snakehead. You can see that elongated fin. An itty bitty head. And if you want to kill them with a baseball bat, it takes seven hits with an aluminum bat to kill one. So we stop bringing baseball bats. You just, some guys, they said the only way they would kill them is they go to the marina in the parking lot and they drive over them with their trucks. Oh my God! They said, That's how we know we can kill. Them. Jeez, yeah, I mean, they are tough. bash their head they in with tough. rocks, severing their dorsal spine. Uh, they, they say you can cut their gills out and it won't kill them. I cut a gills out. I had them in the water for a couple hours. It was just purging blood. <coughs> I was still, you know, just carrying on and did it again. I finally just threw it in the cooler, you know. But it, they were tough. They're they resilient good. freaks of nature. Yeah. If somebody designed some kind of organism to live be the dominant thing in its environment, it's this thing. Next slide, what do we have? Fall to winter. So still active as the water drops. We've seen them in October. That's about when I don't see them. The last one I saw was August or uh, June 24th was that last picture. I haven't seen one since then. So this is uh, Austin who runs the snakehead tournament. They found one frozen in ice. They chipped the ice away and it started flopping around. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. <laughs> and that was, yeah, February 13th. That was two years ago. So where was the ice? Where was the fish? I think I was on Matter Woman Creek. That's mostly where Austin fishes and bow hunts for them. They didn't do the tournament this year. It was unfortunate. It's a fun one, except it goes all night long. You start at 7 p.m. and you go until noon the next day. It's pretty exhausting, fishing all night. All right. And there's a commercial fisherman who caught a bunch of live ones in a net a couple years ago. There was a trough, so the river went like that, and he had his net through that trough, and he caught like 20 of them in January. They were moving around. Next slide. So this picture, Chain Bridge, and this guy, Trent Jones, fishing manager of Bethesda, Orvis, we were watching them all day, and we're like, you could probably just come up with a frog gig and spear one. We're like, that'd be awesome. Five minutes later, this guy walks past us with a pitchfork. He goes down the river, comes back ten minutes later with that on there. And this is the second time he stabbed it. You can already see. So he showed it to us. As we're taking the picture, it flops off. He stabs it again and picks it up, and it's still fighting him. And notice the trash bag. That's how you keep the slime from getting all over your car if you take them home, or your boat. So where you can get them, Chain Bridge, Four Mile Run, most spots are gonna be on the Virginia shoreline because there's a little more access, there's more tidal creeks coming in. Uh, Doug is where they were initially put in, Matter Woman is where they do the tournament. These places are pretty infested. And also add Patuxent River in there because they're in there now. All right, next one. So Chain Bridge. The, uh, the snakeheads and trucks come up to uh, Laurel to spawn every May and June. Yep. They like to move upstream. <coughs> so tell me, when you're down here, so this, they'll get caught in these tidal ponds during floods. 
But anywhere you're fishing for shad, you've got Big Eddie, Little Eddie, you've got the platform, alien pad. All these spots are going to have snakeheads all along here. So if you're throwing like a five or six weight rigged for shad, also have something a little bit heavier and something just big and ugly that's just going to piss one off. We put them, we figure eighted them on their nose. We bounce flies off their nose and they just look at you like, piss off, man. You're, you know, I'm not going to bite it. Like I said, it's, it's just being at the right place at the right time. So the next picture, that's Chain Bridge. That's one after it came up to breathe. And they, I mean, they're right at your toes. They come right up to you. Some of them will just dip back down. Some will turn and make a big splash. But as soon as they come up, some dude's going to run over and throw a spear at it or whatever they have these days. All right, next one. Huntley Meadows. You can't fish there. And I tried fishing below the dam, and I got busted for trespassing. It's not even marked. Uh, I tried fishing Doe Creek where it fills in there and found none. But there's a boardwalk through the entire swamp. And these fish are, you're walking on the board ramp, and they're there, there's one there. They get in there, they try to electroshock them out. I offered, it's like, hey, just let me fish for them. And they're like, if we let you in, then other people are going to want to do it. Apparently people go in at night and shoot them with bows. But um, it's a pretty cool spot. It's right off the beltway. Maybe five minutes. So the next picture should be a close-up of one. No, four-mile run. So four-mile run, they do go up there. If you listen to Lucas from TPFR, he'll always tell you he saw 50 or 60 there the day before. I haven't seen one in a couple years, but they do come up here. Uh, Fidel... There's a guy I know who down that fish is down there. He sees a lot of them in this little channel. Uh, don't see them up by the sewage outflow too often, but they'll be right along the weed lines, along the shore, and they hang out under the bridges. So you can stand here on Route 1 by the Toyota dealership and see some 30, 40 inchers just sitting on the bottom. Just fish that big, like three of them, just right on the sand. So the guys will catch some big ones from boats. It's all, it's not fly fishermen catching them in there. It's all guys on boats using hard tackle. And if you need to park here, you have Toyota dealership, you have uh, Four Mile Run Park, and then up here by the soccer field or southeast. And the airport, right here. There's actually, there's a boat ramp. Right behind that baseball field. Yeah, it's right there. Boat ramp. Wow. Yeah, it's, you can barely get a canoe through there. It's so overgrown. But yeah, if you've got a canoe or kayak, you can launch from there. Uh, maybe they're going to improve it. They're redoing the entire stream. So there's wetlands in there now that have been man-made. They're taking out all the non-native plants. They're doing major stream cleanup, so... I'm thinking that once you get more vegetation up in there, this is the first year I've ever seen hydrilla and milfoil growing there. So I think once we get a little bit more plants and stuff they're planting, it'll attract more snakeheads. Still there, I don't know. Yeah, there's every, I mean, we've pulled BB guns out of there, money. My daughter's always wanted to play with my cell phone. I found a Nokia last week and it's just like, here, play with this phone. I mean, we found sex toys in there. You never know. It's an interesting fishery. All right, next slide. So Rock Creek around House of Sweden, you have the old lock system here. So you can get on land and fish all along here for them. There's some spots up along here. They'll swim up here in the springtime with all the herring and shad. It smells pretty bad from the sewers. If you can you know, wear a buff over your nose or nose clips, you can go up there and find them. And they can get all the way up to the zoo. They can't get over the, uh, the waterfall up there. So that's another spot you can fish for them on land. Next slide. Little Hunting Creek. Not a whole lot of foot access. You can fish this shoreline at low tide. You can fish around here. And then if you walk down here... There's a whole bunch of coves up a little hunting creek you can get through by walking through the woods. If you've got a kayak or a canoe, you put in right here, paddle, ride the tides all the way up. There are a lot of snakeheads in little hunting creek. A lot of stripers too if you can get to them. Carl and I fished down there about a year ago. 
They were busted. We just couldn't get them. Next slide. Fletchers. Alex Binstead's pulling them out left and right in here. Nice, soft, slow water. They can hang out there all springtime, feed, hang out, go spawn, whatever they're doing. And the next picture is one we got. Uh, we were getting ready to go shad fishing, and my friend Rebecca had her spinning rod, and she just threw a crankbait out on her first cast and caught that. My neighbors ate it with a mango chutney that evening. You'll notice the smaller ones have cooler patterns to them. I couldn't believe her first cast. <clears throat> That's just not right. You'll see her out there in her paddleboard fly fishing. She's pretty hardcore. She's not going steelhead fishing with us this year. She wants to go to the south and do some redfish. Because she's got something against fishing Lake Ontario tribes in November. I'd rather go warm places. It's fun. All right, next one. Tidal basin. If you want to see the biggest snakeheads in the river, right after incoming tide, they're going to be right there. Stay on the Ohio Drive Bridge and just look down. They will come up and breathe, and they are absolute monsters. Now, I caught one here. Uh, I've seen people catch them back here and along here. Just walk the edges and fish at your feet. You're going to catch plenty of other fish. I'm going out there on Friday morning with the fishing manager from Orvis Arlington. If you, want to, if you don't have a boat and you want to catch fish, somewhere where there's clean restrooms and water fountains and... You got hot dog vendors over here and food trucks right here. <laughs> Not a better place to go fishing. Where do you park from? Uh, I usually park right along Ohio Drive. It's a three hour limit. I've never been ticketed if I've been over. And I fish the seven foot, 11 inch Orvis bass rod in there because of all the overhanging trees. I just want to be able to get a little lower. How do you get them up at the wall? Uh, a net. I always carry the same net I use when I go steelhead fishing. When I'm down there, I try to carry that net. High tide, it's easier, they're, they're closer to the surface. There's also parking right along here. Uh, no time limits. There's a spot there and there. And that's right next to park headquarters, which also has visitor spots. If you can't ever get a spot during the cherry blossoms, there's always visitor spots there. I shouldn't have put that though on public notice. It takes me about three hours to walk the whole tidal basin. So that's just enough to park there. If you don't catch anything. <laughs> yeah. What else are you catching for the tidal basin? Uh, large mouth, small mouth, stripers. Um, guy saw a muskie in there a year ago. And one of the TPFR guys got a mu tiger muskie off of Roosevelt Island this spring. So then I, I definitely know the guy wasn't probably making it up. You can get American shad, hickory shad, gizzard shad, gar, goldfish. Uh, you know, this time of year, you might even find redfish in there huh. with the drought. Bluegills, crappy. I mean, you, you never know. That's what's so much fun fishing there. All these trees right along MLK are, I mean, 100 bluegill under each one. There's huge carp in there. Everything's in there. You're fishing that from the shore? Yeah, just walk the side, walk the cement, just flip flops. If it's gonna be high tide, I'll wear wellies, but normally just flip flops. And I fish very few patterns. I'll pass my box around. I'll show you pictures of what I fish. I can just carry everything in a shoulder bag, carry some boga grips with me, and I now carry pliers. Hemostats just don't open their mouths as well. Next slide. So you, there's another spot you can fish from. Old Town Alexandria is right here. There used to be great parking at this building, but that's all been torn down. And you can fish either side of this bridge on foot. And then if you can get access at higher tide, you can fish the whole cove along here. But there's definitely spots here you can walk right down and fish. Uh, definitely need a boat if you want to go way up. I went way up there a couple years ago. We didn't see any. <coughs> went all the way to the metro tracks. I saw deer walking down there. Like right where it says Cameron Run. They were deer walking right through here. Which is a little odd. Okay, next slide. Pohick Bay. This is where you get a lot of them. A lot of weeds. If you've got kayaks, you can take this I mean, almost all the way up to Route 1. They're going to be all up in the spatter dock through here. 
the first spot I went to when I went electroshocking with Game in England Fisheries was this shoreline here. So if that's the first spot the biologist goes to, where he knows they're going to be there, that's where you want to head. Right now, this is almost completely choked off with weeds. There's a channel right here where the water goes into outgoing tide. So you can fish that from a boat and just kind of get the edges of it. Hopefully something darts out. I've seen some big ones in there. I was fishing right here. We got a largemouth bass, and as we're taking it off the hook, a snakehead just gingerly went by the boat. <clears throat> They'll do that to you. They'll mess with your head. I haven't gone up Akatine Creek yet. I still want to do that. Maybe now that my kid's in school most of the day, I can have time to go down there. And then the guy who we did our kitchen in our old house would go over here by Belvoir. He used pig kidneys from the butcher shop to catch blue cats, like 60 pounders. So if you want to catch some big blue cats, he says right over here in some deep spots. You can also rent some boats there to fish, and there's a kayak launch. The next slide. Roaches run. A bunch have been caught in there on fly rods. So the one that Brian caught was right here in actual roaches run where the run comes out. Scott Sink has caught one over here. They're all back in the spatter dock. There's some nasty effluent coming in. So they'll ride the tide into here, and then it's just all just lazy tidal water back there. I don't really wade too much through there anymore, just because the mud is pretty stinky, and I don't know, I just don't really wade it much. But they're definitely back in there, and if you've got a canoe or kayak, you can launch it. Right here, there's a little slide. There's always people back there. <clears throat> My friend Andrew, he always looks like he's in disguise. He's got a, like a fedora hat and glasses and a goatee. I think he caught, one year he caught 33 <coughs> snakeheads. Uh, most of them, I think, were back in there. The first one I ever caught, I gave to him. He was in his canoe. I was like, I don't need fish. Take it. So he was pretty happy. He's the one that cut them open and found muskrats <coughs> and, and other things. He once cut one open that had part of a lure he lost that day. So when it bit one of his rubber frogs, ripped off the leg, he then caught it later, went home, gutted it, and it had a <coughs> frog leg in there. Don't see too many at Gravely Point. That's more of a striper fishery. Next slide. So what do you need to catch one of these? I like the eight weight. I like the backbone that I can drag one of these things out of the water with. I've caught a couple on six weights, and it's not that much fun. These things are incredibly strong. Rod manufacturers that, you know, TFO Mangrove, I like the Orvis Recon, Sage Bass Rod. I'm fishing the Orvis Bass Rod now. Large Arbor Reel, you can crank them down. Soft landing line. You want to be delicately approaching these fish. They are very wary of their surroundings. Very good eyesight. I started using Cortland line for carp fishing. Uh, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. I have a 10-year-old floating Cortland. The new clear Cortland is very slick, makes no shadow, the light goes right through it. These are not fish that are going to shred your leader. Their teeth are for gripping, not for shredding. They're cat teeth. They're not like, like shark teeth. They're not serrated. So you don't have to worry about bite guards and metal tippets. I have not had one break line yet, except when it wrapped around the tip of my rod and snapped my line. Big net pliers, don't use the back. You can take them and knock on their head and it sounds like their skull is solid. And the reason I was able to scoop so many out with the net a couple years back is I had polarized glasses. The snaggers didn't have any. They couldn't see them sitting in six inches of water at their feet. I would just walk up with my K-bar net and scoop them out and be like, here's a snakehead. And then we were told we'd get fined. And the main thing you need to carry if you want to target them are trash bags. Big black trash bags. If you don't get a fish, pack out all the garbage where you're fishing. I have trash bags in my car, in my waiting bag. Anytime I'm going out where there might be snakeheads, and the only reason I kill them is because my neighbors want to eat them. I'm not killing them to decrease the population. That's like pulling a dandelion out of your yard and thinking you're going to rid Maryland of dandelions. It's just not going to happen. If you're going out and killing 20, 30 at night, maybe you can, like the bow hunters, but I'm catching one average every three years. I'm not decimating the population. 
Next slide. So like I said, win the lottery, right place at the right time. Mostly blind casting. The ones we sight cast to, like I said, they'll just stare and look at you, and then they'll just move away. I had one guy this summer, he was putting sunscreen on, and a snakehead goes by. And I'm like, snakehead, right, right there. He's like, okay. And I'm like, put the sunscreen. I was going to smack it out of his hand, throw the rod in his hand. And by the time he was done, it was gone, and we didn't see another one all day. Oh, uh, yeah, soft approach. If you can hear yourself waiting, they can hear you too. And don't false cast over them. They're same exact niche, location, feeding habits as a largemouth bass. All you have to do is be a little more quiet. Largemouth are kind of just dumb broods that are always hungry. These fish are a little more cognizant about what's going on. Next slide. So flies. I'll, we can pass my box around if you want to take a look. Some of these are not eating flies. You can't tie a perfectly weedless fly. There are some of these frogs you can throw on a fly rod. This one, you can throw on a six weight. So if you want to pass those around. I'm more concerned about how you fish your fly and how you present it than what you're throwing. Everything in the river eats other fish. You can fish only one fly, you have a clouser minnow of different color and sizes, and cover everything in the river. If you put your fly down properly, quietly, strip it the way that organism is supposed to move through the water, you should be okay. It's going to take you a couple thousand casts, and if it happens, good for you. I mean, we're, we're still figuring this out. I like very sharp hooks. I tie a lot with Matsuo. I carry a hook file with me. Out in Colorado a couple weeks ago, every cast, I was sharpening my hooks. It's just something you'll get more into. Uh, strong hooks that are not going to bend. These things have very hard mouths. That first fish I caught was actually, I've actually caught two. First and third one were hooked on the outside of the mouth. Make sure you're throwing something that, that they're going to eat. They love frogs. That's all they fish for in Thailand are these topwater frogs that grow across the lily pads. They throw these weird looking floating mice. Most of the stuff is on top, which is why I'll throw those frogs or a gutless frog at them. And just for, in general, what you fish, it should be how you fish it is more important than what it is. For bass, trout, steelhead, everything else, presentation is, I think, more key than what you're throwing. Next slide. This is what I tied up for the snakehead tournament last year. And you can see it's about everything's got weed guards or is weedless. Frogs, worms, pet elders, reapers. And all the big bass I caught, I was catching largemouth that big. And you get disappointed when you bring it to the boat and you're like, damn, that's not a snakehead. Most normal days catching a bass that big is pretty damn awesome. But when it's not what you want to catch, you get a little disappointed. My flies are all easy to tie. Uh, not too expensive except for the rainy float foam. That stuff, six bucks for two feet. We're going to lose everything in the weeds and on snags. They're going to get destroyed. You know, I could just make it rain dollar bills in the river or I could throw cheap flies. Next slide. So the gutless frog, that's my variation on Rob Mead's gutless frog. It rides hook up. It's tied it on my Zuo hook. It's crazy sharp. Super easy to tie. It's just expensive and the material is not easy to find. And if you talk to the guys who are catching them, they're catching them on those floating frog patterns. The scum frogs, the KVD rattle frogs. Next, Clouser minnow. This one is just barred with a sharpie to make it look like a banded killifish. Banded killifish, about four inches long. So tie a four inch long Clouser. Sharp hook, that's on a uh, Gamakatsu size four, BS210. Next slide, that's my Snallygaster worm. Works great for largemouth in the tidal basin. I love just walking along the tidal basin and jerking that thing around. Haven't caught a snakehead on it yet, but it was designed for both bass. A bass fly and a snakehead fly to me are interchangeable. Next slide. That's the Matsuo Nano Croaker. They're tiny. They're completely weedless. I mean, some of the things out there, Pat Cohen calls them fluers. You know, fly lure. If you, I don't care what you throw. You know, it's the debate about using beads on hooks in Alaska for trout. It's not really a fly, but people do it. 
you want to throw something that's truly weedless, you throw this. It's going to skate right across all the weeds right now. Now, if you can get those at K-Bar. Is that a compressible body? Yep, little rubber body. Okay. Yeah. There, the amount of frogs out on the market now is nuts. There are more awesome frog lures and flies out there. They're all kind of the same, you know, skirted legs. That one's, and if you feel the hooks on those things, they're freakishly sharp. Next, curly tail, that's got the um, Chuck Craft Ultra Suede tail on it. Just spins through the water like a Mr. Twister. I tie them in pinks, blues, purples, orange, crayfish colors, chartreuse. You're just limited to four different colors of the curly tails. And they're a lot easier on the budget than, than pats, which you can dye yourself. Or use Sharpie fabric pens. Do not bleed on Ultra Suede. Next, Reaper Fly, awesome bass pattern. It's the fly equivalent of a pig and jig. It's got Ultra Suede tail, it's got a rubber skirt on the uh, J Bend hook. Super easy to tie. I think all of these are on YouTube at some point on my channel. <coughs> Next slide, Foam Mouse. I'll fish these during the snakehead tournament. They're made out of craft, oh, not craft foam. These are pipe insulation from Home Depot. It's a six foot piece of just thick black foam. Just trim it to your hook and tie it on. I've had fish blow up during the snakehead tournament on them. I never landed them, but I use that for trout out west. I use it for bass around here, bass up in New York and my friend's farm pond. You throw that thing through a farm pond and it's gonna explode. Next one, ah, that's it. So my contact information to see what I'm up to is all there. You can listen to this podcast and others. I did one exclusively on Snakehead. It's about an hour and a half. It's basically a college essay I wrote, like a thesis on Snakehead. So a lot of what I took from tonight is based on that. The PotomacSnakehead.com is the tournament website. If you're not going to do the tournament, you can still show up at the weigh-in. It's a huge party. It's sponsored by Flying Dog, so free beer. And there's usually oysters and snakehead cooked up for free. Any questions about catching them other than just where, when, and how? Like I said, it's you know they're going to be down there during the shad run. That's your guarantee. During the shad run, Ohio Drive Bridge. Other than that, when you're out in the bays and estuaries, you're hunting for them. And when you catch one, brag about it, because it is not something that happens very often. And hopefully, we're going to become a destination fishery. I mean, once we figure out how to catch these things on the fly, more than once every three years, people are going to start booking trips to come here. I can guarantee it. People go down to Miami for peacock bass. They're going to be coming up for snakehead soon. Rob, where are you guys at? Uh, anywhere along the GW Parkway, uh, on foot, don't have the captain's license to use their boat ramps. We'll do tidal creeks, and then um, just inland. Any any place we can access by foot that's public, we'll go to. They don't really want me doing wade trips in Roach's Run. That's another reason why I don't do it too often. How busy are you this time? Here? I did five trips last week. Yeah, so mostly this time of year is mostly four mile run, sewage outflow. So mostly introductory lessons, people traveling, that will learn how to cast. <coughs> Do Burke Lake trips too. I don't have the key anymore to the Occoquan Reservoir, uh, but they're in there. We don't know how many. There's also muskie in there, which we found out about. Apparently, the guy had been stocking Burke Lake was supposed to be putting them in Burke Lake, but he's putting the muskies in Fountainhead for years. So somebody in, uh, in the club found a muskie about 40 inches long off of Route 66 in Western Fairfax. Yes? How about the Anacostia? I've never taken my boat up to Anacostia. They're in there, though. I know that they used to have some, or they may still have them at the Kenilworth Gardens. Um, yeah, I just haven't had time to go up and explore. I've got a nine horsepower. It'll take me a while to get up there. I'm trying to barter with my neighbor for his 20. He wants a, a smaller one for duck hunting. 
for the winter. So I'm like, let's just swap out our outboards. And then I can go up and fish around Fletcher's during the shadow run. It takes me an hour to get there from Gravely with the nine horsepower. So if I can borrow his 20, I can go catch some shad on my days off from a boat. I'm on shore five days a week during the shad run, so it's nice to get out and fish from a boat. Not worry about catching trees all day long. But if you're in a kayak and you hook one of these things, how far are they going to tow you? They don't really, they fight hard, but I've only had one I've had to chase down. That was the one that it chained bridge that hooked on the outside of its mouth. Um, I don't think you're going to get a Nantucket sleigh ride with one. If you crank your rod down hard enough, you can drag them in. What's DC's rules when it comes to these guys? And then Marylanders, if you catch one, you're supposed to kill it right away. Yeah, DC, they want you to kill it. It's not required. And it's got to be rod and reel only. No hand lines, no gigs, no cast nets, dip nets. You can use bow and arrow from boats, but not from shore. Shores National Park, no weapons allowed. The Park Service got upset because the one I caught and cut the head off, I threw it back in and the body like washed back up on shore. They're like, do you know who did that yesterday? And I'm like, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure. Well, you killed it. I did. I did, yep. I sh- if I would known that all my neighbors eat them, I would have taken it home. I've been offered 50 bucks. Yeah, see, I grew up not eating fish, so I still don't, I don't see them as food, but everyone says, you eat a snakehead, it's the last fish you're going to want to eat. Like, you're not going to want to eat cod, halibut, yeah. not the last specific fish, but you're not going to want to eat other species. And if you do get a chance, if they do the tournament this year, or next year in 2017, Chad Wells, he made... Snakehead banh mi, so the snakehead sliders. He cooks them up. He was on the Food Channel with Andrew Zimmer cooking them. Or it's not Food Channel, that was. He was on the Food Channel for Diners, Drive-Ins, and Dives. Rob, what's your uh, guide rate if you want to work with you? 40 bucks per person per hour, all-inclusive gear. The first, if you're just going to do two hours, it's 100 But if you do three hours, it's 120 You provide everything. All rods, reels, lines, waders. Polarized glasses. Not, they're not guaranteed, but there's, we usually get stuff. We just haven't caught anything big in a while. It's been months since we've had to fight something on the reel. I don't know if it's because it's been hot or what. I know Union Market does. I think they're 17 bucks a pound was the last time I heard. Uh, Rock Bottom. It's Rock Bottom Brewery. No, Rock. What's the barbecue place? Rockland's. Rockland's was selling them for a while. And I think there's just Asian restaurants that sell them. Don't know. And then if you get up to Alewife before Chad leaves... He's got them everything. He does fish tacos with them. Yes. Just this all started with four. Four of them were purchased off of Route One at. Oh yeah, he admitted it. Now it's a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar fine if you're caught with a live one, under the Lacey Act. Only one person is in litigation for getting caught now. There was always a scare of what they were going to do. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. So they're not as. Uh, no, they they're not really as, taking over. I mean, most of that the Potomac historically is kind of a sterile river. You had the spring run fish, and that was it. There were no bass, there were no carp, there really weren't any catfish. The bluegills, um, so they're just mixed in with everything else dumped in there. The tilapia, the goldfish. You go on a four mile run in December, Chuck will tell you you'll see schools of 30, 40 goldfish that big. Fluorescent orange, just swimming around. Uh, so these guys aren't out there just eating everything? So you... No. I haven't heard if the killifish population is decimated, but that's mostly what they eat. When I first heard about the snakehead, they all were afraid that they were going to walk from street to street. Right, picking out dogs in people's backyards and dragging kids in. <laughs> yeah. It's the blue cat. I mean, a guy caught a 72-pound blue cat under chain bridge 
April 9th. And that thing had seven pound American shad in it. So those are the ones you got to worry about. You might catch a blue cat on flies? Oh, we got one two years ago. We were fishing for gar and came, we had to chase it down with the boat. It was about that big. Yeah, we get them every now and then. I've gotten them out of the tidal basin and just give them to people. They're gross. You put, I mean, a 10 pound fish smells like the dumpster behind a sewage or like a seafood market. It just, they smell like rotten seafood. They're, yeah, I mean, they're waiting for someone to catch a 100-pounder in the river. All right, well, thanks for coming out tonight. I guess traffic should be done. Thank you for joining us for the Fly Fishing Consultant Podcast. For more information or to contact Rob, please go to www.robsnowwhite.com